from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant James Mansfield. Recently, the Army authorized another battle star for the Korean War, the Third Winter Campaign. What was this winter like in Korea? What is the soldier going through in order to earn this new battle star? Today, we'd like to take you to Korea and relive for you some of the hardships and the fighting these men have endured. This is the front line in Korea. These mountains are the backdrop for the fighting here. They're swarming with Chinese and North Korean troops. They make a beautiful picture from a distance. In the shadow of these impressive mountains stretching along the entire length of the front are the hills, the bitterly contested hills you read about in the newspapers. These are the strategic positions we must occupy or keep the communists from occupying if we're to hold them and block any large-scale drive to the south. They're desolate hills. Their slopes are scarred and pitted from constant shelling. Every sign of vegetation has been obliterated. This is where our frontline troops live and work. They move about with extreme caution during the day. They are under constant observation by the enemy and within range of his guns. These key hills are precarious positions. The communists want us off of them. Attacks are inevitable and frequent. To hold these positions, our men are forced to dig in, building deep trenches so they can move around unobserved and barricading themselves in underground bunkers to escape the long nightly shellings. During the long wait between attacks, they burrow deeper into the ground, living almost like animals, coming out only to supply themselves with food or charcoal to warm themselves. They use charcoal because it doesn't smoke. That's important when you're living in a poorly ventilated bunker. On the protected southern slopes of these hills, life's a little more normal. They're still within calling distance of the enemy, but here at least they can walk around without worrying about snipers. Here, some of them even have a chance to forget the war and the conditions they live under. Well, for a few minutes, anyway. The chickens were the Sarge's idea. He picked them up back in Seoul. It was supposed to be a gag on the old man, because he was always complaining about eating powdered eggs. The sergeant wasn't thinking of keeping them. That was our idea. We even gave them names. The rooster is Big White Feather. We call that speckled hand Margaret. We feed them the same things we get, mostly sea rations. And they love it. Nobody can figure it out. They seem to thrive on it. Sure took a lot of scrounging to come up with enough chicken wire to build that coop. A couple of the guys even pitched in and built them a bunker. They need one here. You know, it's funny about those chickens. 
They've been under fire almost every night, and it doesn't seem to bother them a bit. Maybe that's why we like to have them around. If they can take it, we ought to be able to. Whatever reason we have for keeping those chicks, it's certainly not the eggs. We only get two or three a day, and they wouldn't go far with a couple of hundred guys. The way it works out, the one that happens to be taking care of them usually gets the eggs. He's welcome to them. Our cooking facilities on the hill aren't so good. We usually let the chickens run around loose during the day. Everybody gets a kick out of seeing and hearing them. We lock them up at night before the commie shells begin coming in. We've been lucky so far. We haven't lost a one. Those chicks have seen a lot more than 30 days of frontline service. They've really earned that combat infantry badge. And while these men are caring for their chickens, a few hundred yards away, other UN troops are studying the enemy positions and trying to figure out what he is up to. That's what the war in Korea is like. It's a war of waiting and watching. The patrolling goes on constantly, probing and testing the enemy, harassing his weaker positions. There's sporadic fighting, but it's mostly skirmishing or jockeying for position. Use up plenty of ammunition here, but they have all they need. Observers keep a close watch on the enemy lines, reporting any suspicious activity. In the trenches, the waiting and watching go on. They eat when and where they can, usually sea rations. And right out of the can. Maybe it doesn't taste like home cooking, but it's good food, and it will supply a lot of strength and energy that's important out here. If there's no fighting going on, the men at the front get at least one hot meal a day. It's prepared in kitchens in the rear and brought up in insulated containers. It's really hot when they get it. That hot meal is pretty important to these guys. And often they'll get it even when there is fighting. Every effort has been made all along the way to supply frontline troops with hot meals. They're tasty, well-balanced meals and carefully prepared. Men returning to the rear often say that the food they receive there never tastes as good as it did at the front. There are some things you have to do no matter where you are and they're no more pleasant at the front than they are anywhere else. Here's how one frontline unit solved its laundry problem. It's primitive, but it cleans them, and it's a lot easier than washing clothes by hand.
The same American ingenuity is put to work in taking care of the dental needs of the men at the front. Normally, these men would get their dental treatments in the rear area. But if they need attention and they can't get back there, the dentist is brought up to them. It's a lot easier for American troops in Korea this year. There's not as much pressure on them. One reason is the training and equipping of South Koreans to replace them. They make good soldiers, and they're anxious to fight. Their casualties have been heavy. At one time, we held over 60% of the front in Korea. Today, we're holding only 25. Now, it's the South Koreans who hold most of the front. Less pressure on our troops means less time they must spend in the front lines. It means they'll spend more time in reserve. And when they are in the line, it means they'll be able to get away more often for R&R. &R. That's uh, rest and rehabilitation. R&R &R never runs more than a week, but to a man who has been in the line for a month or two, it makes a big difference. You can take it just so long, and then you have to get away. It's not that there's anything in particular you want to do. I guess it's just the idea of getting away from the trenches and bunkers for a while. You find yourself dreaming about things like sleeping in a bed between sheets, eating what you like, or just seeing new faces. Something like having a hot bath suddenly becomes very important. I'm not saying all you do on R&R &R is eat, take a bath and go to bed. There's a lot to do in Tokyo, things you can't do out here. Before you know it, your R&R &R is over and you're reporting back. It's not exactly like coming back home. That sign is no gag. You really earn your 45 bucks here. Glad to be back? Are you kidding? Maybe you did miss the old faces. Well, some of them aren't around now. Apart from that, nothing's changed. The bunker? Well, it looks just as you remembered it. That sleeping bag didn't turn into a feather bed while you're away, either. Even the trenches are still the same. You could still walk along any one of them with your eyes closed. A few hours after you get back, you're out on the hill again. And the watching and the waiting start all over again. You take a few pot shots to break the monotony, and it's just like you've never been away at all. A man does a lot of climbing in Korea. It's tough on the back and legs, particularly when you're lugging a piece of heavy equipment. It's even worse in the winter. Here's how one unit handled the problem. It's only a couple of hundred yards to the top from here, but if the trails are icy and you're loaded down with supplies and equipment, it seems like 10 miles. 
It's just as bad coming down. It could take an hour or two. Now we can ride up or down, and it only takes a few minutes. It only took the engineers a couple of weeks to set up our tramway. They could have done it faster, but they had a lot of salvaging to do to get the stuff they needed to build it. If you ask me, next to the guns, that tramway is the most important piece of equipment on the hill. It's the only way of getting our wounded down without shaking them up pretty badly. Some of our guys owe their lives to that tramway. Speaking of wounded, Here's a machine that saved thousands of lives in Korea. It can go anywhere, and it does. A few years ago, a seriously wounded soldier stranded in the mountains would have had little chance of reaching a hospital alive. It would have taken hours or even days just to get him out of the mountains. Today, he's carried to one of the big hospitals in the rear in a matter of minutes, and it's done smoothly and safely. Today, a soldier can get to a hospital in Korea as fast as he could if he were at home. We've learned a lot during the three winters we've been in Korea, but snow and ice are still big problems. Moving a heavy gun like this up a narrow mountain road is hard enough under the best conditions. With snow and ice on the road, it becomes a slow and dangerous job. Weapons are twice as hard to maintain in the snow, but the fighting goes on as usual. In spite of the ice and snow, there's plenty of ammunition here to keep this big gun firing. It's the same way all along the entire front. When the ammunition is needed, it's always there. Winter makes patrolling doubly dangerous, but the patrols continue to go out. And snow or no snow, the hot chow comes up as usual. The mountain trails are icy, and it takes the South Korean porters twice as long to bring the food up from the rear. It may take longer, but it usually gets there. These men look forward to that one hot meal a day. The colder it is, the more important that hot meal becomes. They appreciate it when they get it. It seems quieter in the winter all along the front. The snow muffles the sound of the big guns.
A Chinese prisoner is brought in. He is being processed by this Ethiopian officer before sending him to the rear. With the help of an interpreter, he's carefully questioned. He can supply valuable information on the plans and disposition of enemy troops. Here's the face of the enemy. He's not an impressive looking soldier by our standards, but he's a good fighter and he's had a lot of experience. Thanks to the Russians, he's also well equipped and well trained. Here's another aspect of frontline life, and it's an important one. These men don't get entertainment very often, and when they do, they really appreciate it. It doesn't really matter what it is. Of course, if it happens to be a good-looking girl, so much the better. But it really doesn't matter. These guys are starved for entertainment. Through the USO, show people from Broadway and Hollywood are regularly brought to Korea to entertain the men. Much of their entertaining is done close to the front lines. In spite of the dangers and the discomforts, most of these people consider it a privilege to be able to help these men forget the war and the grim part they are playing in it, even if it's only for a few minutes. Just as men at the front develop a new appreciation for entertainment, they also develop a new and deeper appreciation for religion. Hard-working army chaplains see that services are held regularly all along the front. These men take their religion seriously. Some come from religious homes, others just picked it up in the trenches. All of them seem to find comfort in these simple hillside services. A few miles away in another sector, Preparations are already underway for an attack. There's a lot to do, and it goes on for days. The plans for the attack have to be carefully studied. Every piece of equipment must be gone over and put in perfect running order. If anything has to be repaired or replaced, it must be done now. Once the attack begins, mechanical failures can be disastrous. As the hour for the attack approaches, the tanks move forward to take on ammunition and fuel. Early one morning, the rocket launchers move in and lay down a barrage. The attack begins. You can't see the enemy, but he's there, waiting. Infantry troops move up in the wake of the tanks. Our planes are supporting with napalm and smoke. the hill and now the infantry takes over fighting every inch of the way
They finally get to the top. Now all they have to do is stay there. The fighting goes on into the night. into the next day. Along the rest of the front, men continue to stand guard on other hills we have won, waiting, watching, and fighting to hold them. They've been doing it for three years. They'll do it again, if necessary. history books will mark the third Korean winter as just another campaign. But for the men who fought there, the fighting men, it has been an experience not easily forgotten. Next week you will have a chance to see what the U.S. 7th Army is doing in Europe to prevent a repetition of Korea. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.